Hello everybody, welcome back to Physics 425. Uh, I want to start by just recalling some of the things we talked about last time. One of the things we did is we said, let's imagine that we have some sum over uh, a k vector where k vector represents the available states in k space for some system. Uh, but the sum is applied to some function that depends only on the magnitude of k. Well, what we found is that we could convert that sum uh, over vector k to a sum over the magnitude of k that we could then convert into an integral. And so the entire process would take the sum over vector k of a function of the magnitude of k and convert it to an integral over the magnitude of k. Uh, and so that's something we made use of last time and we'll make use of again. Um, so in particular, we were thinking about the a system of non-interacting bosons and we were summing over the Bose-Einstein distribution function. And so if we summed over all of the available states, of this distribution function that would tell us the total number of particles in our system. The first term in the sum would tell us the number of particles on average in the ground state. And then the second term would tell us the number of particles on average in state one with energy epsilon one. And then we would continue and sum over all of the possible states. What we did is uh, we applied this method to convert our sum over vector k into an integral over the magnitude of k. And it came down to this expression over here, where the 3.42 depended on the number density of the particles in your system and the mass of each of the individual particles. So we use numbers for liquid helium-4, which resulted in this numerical factor of the 3.42. Um, and then it was equal to some integral that involved eta, where eta is the chemical potential divided by kBT. And what we did is we used this condition to determine the temperature dependence of eta and therefore the chemical potential mu. The way we did it is we picked some temperature T and we evaluated the left hand side of this equation. And then we just made a guess for the value of eta and evaluated the integral. And we kept adjusting eta until the integral on the right hand side was equal to the numerical value on the left hand side. And once we had done that, we would know eta and therefore mu at that temperature and then we could repeat for a bunch of different temperatures. And so this was done. And so here, for example, is the temperature dependence of eta that was determined for our system of identical bosons. Um, and then if you simply multiply this by KBT, you get the temperature dependence of the chemical potential. Um, so what was important is that we observed that eta approached zero as temperature approached zero. And so that's, that's something that we didn't know beforehand because if the chemical potential and T are both approaching zero uh, as T goes to zero, then we didn't know how that ratio would, would vary. But now, but now we figured it out. Okay, good. So what we're going to do today is we're going to try to see if we can understand or come up with a condition that would tell us the temperature below which the vast majority of the bosons start to enter into primarily the ground state. And so we're going to define what's called a Bose-Einstein condensation temperature. Okay, so the starting point is since we know the temperature dependence of the chemical potential. We can now plot some 
of the terms. In this expression that we had for the total number of particles in our system, which was the sum over k vector of the Bose-Einstein distribution, which we remember the Bose-Einstein distribution tells us the, num the average number of particles in each k state. And so this would be the average number of particles in the ground state, in the first excited state, second excited state, and so on. Okay, um, so N0, the ground state, has an energy epsilon equals zero, and the Bose-Einstein distribution then becomes e to the minus mu over kBt minus one. And remember mu was, uh, mu over kBt is what we defined to be eta, and so this is just one over e to the minus eta minus one. But we already now, we now know the temperature dependence of eta, so we could plot N0 as a function of temperature. Uh, we could also do the same thing for Ni. The only difference is now that the energy of state I is not zero, so we've got to include epsilon I, which would look like this. Um, um, and so we could alternatively write this as e to the epsilon i over kBt minus mu over kBt, which is minus eta, and then minus 1. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to define epsilon i in terms of a temperature. So for example, we could say that in temperature units, the energy of state I is Ti, which is epsilon I over Kb. So I'm gonna pick different values for epsilon I over Kb and plot some of these terms. Okay, so the first one is just the ground state so this is the N0, uh, the number, average number of particles in the ground state as a function of temperature. Um, and so this is the one that just looks like 1 over e to the minus eta minus 1. Okay, and so that's N0. And so as, you, as we saw last time, it, when we get to low temperatures, the number of particles in the ground state really starts to diverge. And so all of the particles in the system start entering into the ground state. And so that's not so surprising. Uh, I'm gonna add to this plot the red curve. And so this is for epsilon over KBT is a 0.25 Kelvin. And so let me just remind you of Ni was gonna be one over e to the epsilon i over kBt minus eta minus 1. And so to make this plot, we, we need to know how eta varies with temperature, and so that's what we did last time. Okay, and so what you could see is it looks like uh, as temperature goes um, to zero or becomes small, the number of particles entering this state with energy uh, equivalent to 0.25 Kelvin grows, but then it, it doesn't diverge. It starts to kind of flatten out a little bit. And so it starts to flatten out as we get to really low temperatures. And so let's keep going. Now we pick a state with a temperature of one Kelvin. And so that's the green curve. And in this case, what we've done is we've actually, seems like we've reached a maximum Okay, and then let's go and here's two Kelvin. And in the two Kelvin case, we've reached that maximum and then we can clearly see that actually as we go to even lower temperatures, particles start to leave that state. So the occupancy of this two Kelvin state goes down at very low temperatures. And that's just really an indication that those particles are moving into the even lower energy states that have energy less than two Kelvin. Um, okay, 
So at low temperatures, the occupation of higher energy states peaks and then starts to decrease. And so here I just add a whole bunch of different uh, energy states. And so it's up to all the way up to 15 Kelvin. And so you can see in that case, what happens is for the 15 Kelvin state, where that peak is, is at a relatively higher temperature. And by the time you get down to the lowest temperatures on this scale, the average occupancy is, uh, you know, 0.01 or there's a, there's only a 1% chance that that state is occupied. Okay, so um, what we're going to do next is we're going to say, uh, well, let's return to this expression for the number of particles in our system, which was the sum over the uh, Bose-Einstein distribution. And so we'll just write out some of these terms again. Uh, e to the minus eta minus one is the ground state, plus one over e to the epsilon one, uh, sorry, epsilon one over kBT minus eta minus one, plus one over e to the epsilon two over kBT, minus eta, minus one, and plus other terms. What we know is that as temperature goes really small, then um, eta goes to zero. So below some temperature, which we'll call Tc, and so I'm gonna to refer to this as a critical temperature. So below some critical temperature, which we haven't determined yet, But let's say there is some temperature low enough where we can say that the eta is so small that epsilon over kBT dominates uh, the value of eta. Below some temperature Tc, eta will be close enough to zero that we can make the approximation that epsilon one minus mu, uh, or let's let's be a little more specific. Uh, so we could say uh, epsilon one over kBT minus eta is approximately epsilon one over kBT. And of course, that's gonna be true for the higher energy states as well. And so what we're going to do is we're just going to ignore eta in all of the all of the terms for uh, all of the energies that are above the ground state. Okay, so in that case, for t greater than or equal to t c. Uh, sorry, no, t less than or equal to t c we can approximate the number of particles in our system as one over e to the minus mu over kBT. Uh, let's write that as eta. Minus one. Okay, so that's the number of particles in the ground state. So we have to keep eta for that one. But for all of the excited states, we'll just drop the eta. And so we'll say this is the number of particles in the ground state. And this is the number of particles in excited states. And so maybe we'll call this N excited, and we'll call this one N zero. 
so what I'm going to do in the next set of slides is I'm going to show you plots of Ni um, equal to the exact expression e to the epsilon i over kbt minus eta minus 1 and ni approximated as 1 over e to the epsilon i over kbt minus 1 uh, versus temperature. And what we're going to do is we're just going to verify that below some critical temperature uh, Tc that these two look the same. So verify that the approximation works for T less than or equal to some critical temperature Tc. Okay. So the solid curves are the ones that we showed previously. Those are the exact expressions. And then the dashed curve is the approximation where we ignore eta or mu over kBT. And so you can see that I've shown this for the 15 Kelvin uh, case. Uh, epsilon i over kB is equal to 15 Kelvin. And the approximation works below a temperature of about, what is that, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, maybe just above 4 Kelvin that works. Okay, and then we'll add another curve, the next higher one, and the approximation works again, but maybe now we have to get to a slightly lower temperature in order for this to be valid. Maybe it's slightly below 4 Kelvin. Okay, and then we keep adding curves, and you can see that if we really do get to low enough temperatures, then the approximate dotted curves become a good approximation to the real values, the full expressions. Um, we just have to make sure we're at a low enough temperature. Okay. So this blue shaded region defines what I refer to as some kind of sweet spot where when we neglect the chemical potential or this eta value, then N excited is approximated very well by uh, our approximate expressions without eta. Um, and then also what's going to happen is Although the occupancy of the ground state, the black curve, is the highest, there are many, many, many excited states. So if we still add up all of the particles in the excited states, we will still have far more particles in excited states than in the ground states. But if you compare the ground state to any individual excited state, it will always have more particles in that lower energy state. Okay. So let's make some comments about this. For T less than Tc, and you can see what we're going to do is we're going to approximate here that the edge of this blue shaded region where our approximation starts to work at all temp at all for all energy states, we're going to approximate that as our Tc. So for temperatures less than Tc, um, and excited is approximately equal to the sum over k of 1 over e to the epsilon k over kbt minus 1. Um, and so what we could do is we could convert this to an integral using the methods that we developed last time. And so it's going to be an integral over the magnitude of k. And if we do this following the exact same steps of last in the last video, what we would get is this result. And then if we made the substitution for x is x squared is h bar squared k squared over 2 m kbt, then this would 
become the following. This is all to the three halves, and then we'd have an integral over x now. And so this is very much like last time. The only difference is that in the denominator of the integral, we would have e to the x squared minus eta. We've dropped the eta now. Okay, so that's at uh, temperatures less than Tc, we could count the number of excited states. Uh, and I'm going to call this equation A, and we're going to come back to it in a little bit. All right, the other point that I want to make is that at Tc, the number of particles in excited states is still much greater than the number of particles in the ground state. And so the point is that although the ground state has more particles than any individual excited state, There are many, many excited states such that the total number of particles in excited states or equivalently not in the ground state at t is equal to tc is still much greater than n0, oh, the number of particles in the ground state. Okay, so if that's true, we say therefore almost all particles are in excited states. When T is equal to Tc. And so that means then the number of particles in our system is basically the number of particles in excited states and so this is now at temperature Tc, and so here, let's do this in a couple of steps. This would be the number of particles in excited states would be epsilon k over kBt. Uh, at Tc, we can still neglect the chemical potential or eta, and so we won't write the minus eta, but we're still going to have uh, temperature now, specifically at temperature Tc, and then we go minus one. If we put in uh, for energy, the energy of a free particle, h bar squared k squared over 2m, then this becomes sum over vector k, one over e to the h bar squared k squared over 2m kbtc minus one. Then what we can do is we can convert the sum over vector k to a sum over the magnitude of k, and then convert that sum over magnitude of k to an integral, um, and we would get that this is equal to um, v over 2 pi squared 2m kb tc over h bar squared to the 3 halves and using the same substitution uh, x squared equals k squared h bar squared over 2m kbt uh, c this time we would get x squared dx e to the x squared minus 1. Um, this integral you can evaluate numerically and just so we know this could be evaluated numerically. In the last video, we couldn't evaluate the integral because it had some 
unknown temperature dependent function eta in there, but now we don't have that. And so if you stick this into uh, Maple or MATLAB or Python or whatever you're using, you can evaluate this integral and it's 1.15758. Okay, and so this is the condition that we're gonna use to define TC. So we use this condition to define TC. So the condition is that uh, we're at a low enough temperature that we can neglect the chemical potential, but at the same time, the number of particles in excited states is vastly more than the number of particles in the ground state. I'm going to call this equation B. It's identical to equation A, other than instead of temperature T, we have a temperature TC. Okay, so A and B are identical except for temperature uh, is just T instead of TC in equation A. So let's combine A and B. And so we're gonna combine them, we're gonna take this ratio. So equation A was an expression for the number of particles in excited states. And equation B is an expression for the number total number of particles in our system. And so when we take the ratio, we get N excited over N. And because the two equations are identical except for the temperature, everything cancels except for this T over TC and it's to the 3 halves power. And so we can use this to find the number of particles in excited states for T less than TC. Okay, so for example, right at TC, the ratio is going to be equal to 1, and so all of our particles are in excited states. If we could go to t equals 0, then none of the particles would be in excited states. Uh, alternatively, what we could do is we could say the number of particles in the ground state is the total number of particles minus the number of particles in excited states, such that n0 over n is equal to 1 minus n excited over n, or n0 over n is equal to 1 minus t over tc to the 3 halves. And so here is the number of particles in the ground state when t is less than tc. Uh, I'm going to insert, I think, another slide here. Okay, so let's make a plot of this. Uh, so we're going to make a plot that is going to look like uh, temperature on the horizontal axis. Uh, sorry, temperature. And over here, we're going to have RTC. And I'm going to make a horizontal line that sits at 1 and down here is 0. So the first thing we'll do is maybe we'll plot the number of excited particles. So this is the ratio of particles in excited states to the total number of particles. And we said if we go to t equals 0, this ratio is going to be 0. So let's just going to start over here. And then if we go to TC, uh, this ratio is going to be 1. And so it's going to end up over here. And if you plot this 
as a smooth function of temperature, it looks something like this. Okay, and then we could do the same thing for the number of particles in the ground state. If we go to t equals zero, uh, we get one minus zero, so the ratio becomes one. And if we go to TC, we get 1 minus 1, and so we'll get 0. And this has the same sort of temperature dependence. It's just a, a mirror image. Here at this crossing, this happens at about 1 half, or it does happen at 1 half, and that's when the temperature is about... 0.63 TC. Okay, and so there's a prediction for how the number of particles in excited states and the ground state varies with temperature. Okay, so let's let's go back to equation B here, and if we combine all of the numerical factors, so the integral is 1.157. Uh, we have a 1 over 2 pi squared, we have a 2 to the 3 halves. If we combine all those numerical factors, we get the following. So combining the numerical factors in B gives N is about 0 0.166 times V, the volume of the system. And then we have M KB TC uh, over H bar squared to the three halves. And we'll call that equation star. Okay. So let's note the following. Note that at T is equal to TC, Equation star is a constant, right? If we look at everything on the right-hand side of equation star, we have the system volume, uh, the mass of the particles, kb, tc, h bar squared. None of those things vary. So since uh, v, t is equal to tc, m, kb, h bar are all constant or held fixed. Okay, so what would that mean if we tried to add particles to our system now at t equals tc? So what if we tried to add particles to the system? Well, equation star suggests that n cannot change. I'm going to add another page here. So what we want to do is we want to just recall that to calculate star, we assumed that the number of particles in our system was equal to the number of particles in the excited state. That is, we neglected the number of particles that were sitting in the ground state. So what equation star is really suggesting is that at t equals tc, it's the number of particles in excited states that are fixed. It is really the number of particles in excited states that is fixed. So if we tried to add particles to our system at t equals tc, 
Equation star is telling us that all of those particles are going to go into the ground state. So we, if we add particles to the system at t equals tc, they must go into the ground state. Okay, and so that's Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, we have this condition where at a certain temperature, the number of particles in excited states is remaining constant. And if the system was to gain particles, they all have to go into the ground state. Um, if we rearrange equation star, so let's rearrange equation star so that we solve for KBTC, uh, what you get is the following from star uh, KBTC is equal to 3.31 h bar squared m uh, n the number density particles number of particles per unit volume to the two-thirds power and so this defines the critical temperature for Bose Einstein condensation. Um, so another way to think of this is instead of holding temperature fix and changing the number of particles, what we could do is we could keep the number of particles fixed. So if we keep n fixed but reduce T below TC, we'll find that a large fraction of the particles in that were originally in excited states move into the ground state. And so this phenomenon where below TC you have large occupancy of the ground state, that's called Bose-Einstein condensation. So this is called Bose-Einstein condensation. or BEC, TC is the critical temperature below which Bose-Einstein condensation occurs. And so we actually already saw some of this uh, when we drew this plot where we see that below TC we have an ever increasing number of particles in the ground state which is the blue curve n0 over n and ever decreasing number of particles in excited states which is the red curve oh whoops sorry my little tablet program crashed and okay Good. And so I just wanted to show you um, one more thing here. And so this is the same plot that we already looked at. Um, what we could do is we could use this equation star here, this version of it, to calculate TC for a given uh, number density of particles n and a given mass of the particles m. And so here is N and M for uh, liquid helium-4. And so this is for liquid helium-4. And when you plug that into this expression, you get a TC of uh, 3.1 Kelvin. So experimentally, we observe 
uh, superfluid. The superfluid transition in liquid helium-4 at 2.17 Kelvin. Okay, and so 3.1 and 2.17 are not exactly the same, but it's pretty close. It's not so bad. Um, the reason for the difference is that everything we've done in discussing Bose-Einstein condensation was done in terms of uh, a system of non-interacting bosons. And so these are particles that have only kinetic energy. They don't bump into each other or anything like that. In a liquid, uh, that's not a great approximation. And so the difference between these two temperatures is uh, due to interactions between the helium atoms in the liquid. Uh, but the this transition to superfluid behavior is due to a Bose-Einstein condensation of the uh, of the helium atoms, the bosons in the system. Okay, uh, I don't think I need that. Um, so another thing to think about is in in a superconductor, uh, what you have are electrons that at below a certain temperature start to conduct electricity without any losses um but electrons are fermions so they can't they can't by themselves be entering into a bose einstein condensation in a in a conventional superconductor what happens is the electrons pair up via an interaction with the lattice of the superconductor and so this pairing mechanism kind of in some sense, joins two electrons together, and so they make an effective boson, and then they can condense into the ground state below a certain critical temperature. Okay, and so what we start to see is that these quantum considerations of our microscopic systems eventually can lead to very dramatic manifestations of macroscopic quantum effects. And so the picture on the right here is the fountain effect in superfluid helium-4. And the picture on the left is a magnet levitating above a superconducting disk. Okay, good. So that's where we'll stop for today. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.